along the way, I've found myself in that same exact situation too, which is what keeps it so fun is that there's always things that you learn in the beginning that you circle back to once you have a better understanding of the overall art and you realize like, man, there's so much more to these initial things I picked up that I just thought I understood from the, from the jump and I, I don't. So was there any main, any primary thing that you can think of as, as far as uh, mind blowing moments in jujitsu that still stick out in your head to this day? You know, j j just like we were just talking about earlier, I think in everybody's jujitsu career, it does this. You expand your information, you expand your information, and then you start going, yeah, that's garbage, that's garbage, that's garbage. And it shrinks back into a, a small amount of information. You know, the most groundbreaking to me was rediscovering the fundamentals. Because, you know, when I started, it was all fundamentals at Hickson's, all fundamentals. And Hodge Gracie is a great example of the Bruce Lee quote. You know, I'm not afraid of the dude that knows 10,000 kicks. I'm afraid of the dude that knows one, but he's practiced it 10,000 times. It's not at the Jedi level. It's just that that's all he's, he, he only knows one system and that's all he spent his time repping. So Hodger Gracie's basic mount to a basic cross collar choke is unstoppable. And that's empirically proven at the world championship level. The dude doesn't do flying go-go platas. He doesn't do a barambolo. He arm drags, takes the back from the closed guard and chokes you yep. or he sweeps you and mounts you and he arm locks. It, it's, 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 but, but that guy hasn't been, you know, uh, he, he hasn't had his mind sidetracked by, Oh shit, a flying barambolo. What? Let me, let me, you know, and, and before you've perfected, you know, just a basic sweep or say a, a basic lumberjack, then you go, okay, well, well, from here, I could also do the matrix or I could do a barambolo or I could single leg X and I could, Instead of just going, you know what? I'm going to Apple stock 84. I'm going to stay with this lumberjack sweep. And you get it to where the dude rises out of posture and he's on his back because that's all you've done for 20 years. And so you look at it. It's, not, it, it's a mathematical equation. You know, if, if a dude is, has done the half lumberjack, the one half lumberjack, and he's done it for 20 years, 15 a day, Really, most people, how many, how many times do you think they've repped that, even having trained 10 years? A couple hundred? Yeah. Maybe 200? Because they've done so many other sweeps. If you've done 200, how successful is that sweep going to be? Have you really perfected to the 100% pieces of leverage and adjusting exactly? It's those elements. It's me rediscovering that that, that made me go, oh, my God, okay. I mean, I'm not kidding. When I told you, I thought the trap and roll was garbage as a blue belt. I was an upper blue belt thinking, okay, well, man, that may work on white belts, but it doesn't. And of course, I was bridging to one side. They'd, boom, they'd base out and they pop. And then, you know, it, it's once you, once you understand the concept of exactly how to bridge and you go, oh my God, Eureka. Okay, that's it. If, if, even if I let go of the leg, because when your butt comes away from your ankle, they're going to free that leg. One of two things are going to happen. I'm either going to succeed and get in the trap and roll, or he's going to put the leg out, in which case I'm bringing my leg under. When you understand this, it's fundamental. It's like, it's unstoppable. If you get a hold of the arm and you do it correctly, it will, you will reverse them or the leg will come out. It's their only remaining resource to stop being reversed. And it's things like that, that when your brain starts to understand, you go, okay, I'm going to commit the time into throwing thousands of reps into that to where I'm not thinking about it. Now I'm putting one plan in motion and I'm already ready for the way that he's going to defend it. In the kids class, we call it a decision tunnel. You want to put your training partner down a decision tunnel. I'm going to put something in. I'm going to go down this hallway. I know what's already behind every single door. They can open any one, but I'm already ready for it. The kids will tell you if you line them up right now. I I've said this a thousand times. What's, what's the best type of opportunity in the world? One that you already knew was coming. Well, that's good jujitsu. When you put something in play going, this is either going to work or he's going to do one of these five things. And I already instinctively have my five recipes for all of these five. That sounds you, you can either learn that or you can learn the myriad of iterations of, you know, thousands of different variations of, or you can do the six that you know are going to happen every match. And, you know, that's, the, that's Bruce Lee at its core. That's the 15,000 reps on a single kick. That's excellent. Does that influence the reason why you start your students in specific positions whenever they roll rather than just having them both start from either a sitting position or from the knees? Do you feel that by, by designing the class in that way, it helps them be in direct contact with those positions that they can get plenty of reps and, and build that muscle memory? Yeah, but also, you know, seated, 
if you're seated in front of somebody, you're going to technical lift. You're going to do one of two technical lifts. You're going to do a one hand technical. You're going to do a no hand technique. We're not going to sit on our butt and let a guy stand in front of us. That's just our mission statement in the class. So it's just an unrealistic position. So if we're going to start grappling, we're going to start from a position that exists, whether it's Casey Katami, side control, switch base side control, or the full mount or the half guard. We're going to do something that you wouldn't just stand up and walk away. I mean, as I tell my students, if you're on your butt and an adversary is standing in front of you, get to your feet. You're not going to scoot next to them and try and pull them into your closed guard. They're, you know, and, and, but, but that's for self-defense. Now, if it was a sub-only tournament and you're not penalized for pulling guard, I'd say get to the guard and get the party started. So that, 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 that recipe is 100% legit. Like 100%. I'll, you know, if I wanted to design a white belt world champion, I'd teach him how to jump guard and fight from the closed guard. That's it. It'd be like, okay, if you get your guard passed, fuck it, you're going to lose. But let's just work on closed guard and jump and guard. Because you can, you can almost unilaterally insist on that position. And in a year, if that's all you did and somebody else is learning closed guard, half guard, guard passing, mount escapes, mount attacks, and all you've studied is attacks from the closed guard, as a white belt, you're going to jump guard and you're going to finish everybody. Almost 100%. So I, I get the recipe, but at our school, I, I never want my, a son of mine to get his face smashed in on the playground. So, you know, self-defense and, and real aspect fighting comes into a, the play in everything that we teach. So that's why we don't, uh, you know, start from kneeling or on our butts and clap hands. We start from something that's actually going to happen. And you got to work your way out of that position. You got to first dig yourself out of the hole before you can go on the offense.